Well, amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be together this morning. Let's stand. We've got a special service plan today presented by the Cultural Connections team. Uh, so come on in. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing Risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. Jesus is living in his church. Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. claim his next song is called Deeper, and uh, we're going to start with the basses, and then add tenors, and then add altos, and then add sopranos. So if you know what you are, sing in that one. If you're not sure, just pick one. <laughs>
Amen, church. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, everyone. So excited to have you here with us today. Um, we have a special service today. The Cultural Connections Committee have been working really hard um, just to help draw our hearts closer to God and Jesus' mission to love our neighbor as ourself and to love our enemies. I wanted to start out this morning, we're just going to do something together, um, a meditative prayer, and just to help us to really focus on God. Sometimes on a Sunday, I don't know about you, it's like so stressful, waking up and getting ready and looking presentable and all the other things you had to do this morning, just, or things you have that you're thinking about this afternoon, just to put those to the side and really quiet our minds and connect with God. I wanted to start out with this scripture in Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so if you feel comfortable, please close your eyes. And we're just going to start off and take a few deep breaths and quiet our minds. So breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Nice and big. In through your nose and out through your mouth. God, thank you so much that we can be still that we can put all our cares and our burdens to the side. Thank you, God, that you carry them for us. Thank you that you come to us in the midst of our challenges when we feel so overwhelmed, God, that you come right there. The things that we care about, you care about. God, help us, each one of us right now, um, to be able to quiet ourselves, to come into your presence and really be able to worship you. God, you have done everything for us. You've given us life. You've given us friends, family. God, you've given us this amazing day that we could come together and worship you. And we pray, God, that you feel really encouraged. God, we pray that you feel lifted up and exalted. God, um, please just help us to really connect with you today and just adore you. You are so worthy of all adoration and all praise. And we love you, God, and we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. You got some good deals today at the market. It's always better going with you, Martha. <gasps> Jesus. So glad to see you. Are you staying here for a while? I was on my way to Jerusalem, but I figured I had to stop by Bethany and see my friends. Oh, we're Martha. so glad. Come in. I see you've got a lot more followers now. <laughs> I'll get the wine. I'll prepare some food. So good to be here. A lot's been going on since we've been here last time. I see you guys are doing well. It's an awful adventure sometimes being a disciple. So as we were discussing on the road, let's say you were a shepherd and you had a hundred sheep and one of them runs off. You know the one. He runs off and you gotta go find it. So you go and you look high and low, you search real lot for it. And then you find it and you're happy. You're joyful, and you put it on your shoulders, and you bring it back home, and you call out your neighbors, and you say, come, rejoice with me, for I have found the lost sheep. That's the way it's going to be in heaven, when one sinner repents. Over all the 99 that don't repent, the one sinner that repents, it's going to be a party. Is she not a Jewish woman? that was born in the same house as me? What is she thinking? Does she think they're gonna get up and serve themselves? Why do I have to do this all by myself? What is Jesus thinking? He's probably starving by now. 
And look at all his followers. They look like they could use a good meal. And there's my sister, sitting there like a prima donna, just letting me to do all the work. I wish I could do that. Or probably be known as the sisters who were not hospitable to the Messiah. <sighs> oh, oh, I don't think we're going to have enough figs. Oh, oh, I should have went to market earlier. Oh, but I had to help Mary wash the clothes. Oh, I hope Jesus likes the wine. Maybe I should have served the sweeter one as well. Oh. Oh, oh, I need Mary to help me. This is getting overwhelming. I really want this to be perfect. Oh. I see it's a bit crowded in here. Oh, maybe we should have pushed the tables back a little bit. Oh, I wish I had time to plan. Oh, I would have done so much better. I know I could have done better. I could have done it so different, but now I feel like such a complete failure. Martha, Martha, you are troubled by many things, but your sister has chosen what is good, and it will not be taken from her. As we prepare for communion, I like to leave us with one thought before I pray. I feel like all of us can relate to Martha in some way. In a world where we're just troubled and worry about many things, we seem to forget the one thing that matters. And that's Jesus. That's having a relationship with him. I know myself that I can relate to Martha. I struggle a lot with anxiety, and I get distracted a lot. So I feel like it was not a coincidence to be asked to be playing Martha. <laughs> it's God. <laughs> Um, it helped me to look and say, he is the one thing that I need. He's that peace that passes all understanding. The other thing is to remember to be still and know that he is God. Being still is not easy for me. And some people may relate. But that's what's going to bring you peace. And that's the only thing that matters, not doing all these things, but being able to relate to people around you, to spend those relationships, but mostly to focus and fix our eyes on the Lord. So let us go to prayer and pray for the communion. Father God, I thank you so much for this example of Martha. God, I pray that we all take time to stop and focus on you. Especially at this time, God, as we're communing with you, God, to really focus on what you did for us, that you died on the cross for us, for our sins, for my sin. God, you did that for us because you love us so much. 
you will always be there. You will always be that one constant. Things can come and go in this troubled world, and we worry about so many things. But the only thing that really matters, God, is you. So God, I pray that we remember that now as we take the bread to represent your body and the juice to represent your blood for what you did for us. Because you are the only one, and you are the peace that passes all understanding. I love you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I, I, in, I, I like how I feel right now. We wanted, we wanted to start the service in more of a meditative way where we can relax and reflect. And I feel the results of that right now. Anyone else? I normally get up here and want to go, <clears throat> My name is Marvin S.B., and I'm, I'm privileged and, and, and I'm grateful to be here to share about some things that um, have been on my heart for a little while, and I'm, I'm grateful for the Cultural Connections Ministry here um, with the goal of uh, bringing unity to a world that so often divides us. And um, there's a, a great team of people behind the scenes and headed up mostly by De Denise and Byron, but... Uh, excited, I know, it's, let's, we can go ahead. <laughs> I know both those guys don't, they don't want that, but we, we, we're grateful for her. Um, but um, uh, it's been encouraging and it's been revealing to me to be a part of the process. And if you don't know today, if you, if you were invited or, or if you've missed the announcements, um, today is a kickoff of a three week program where we're gonna look into um, how our brains work and how our brains manage situations that uh, can be uh, filled with conflict. How's that work? And how's that work um, in our Christian faith? How's that jive with the Bible? And how does that jive with my walk with Christ? 
And um, wasn't it, um, can anyone relate to that skit and how Martha was feeling? Go, you can raise your hand. Anybody? I know. Uh, um, and it's, you didn't see it from back, back there, but up here, a lot of women raised their hand and a lot of men did not. Men go, oh, well. If he gets hungry, he'll, he'll say something. <laughs> and therein lies conflict. No. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I want to start by saying this, and this is very important for you to know. I love sweet potato pie. No, no. No, I love. You don't understand the level I'm talking about. I love sweet potato pie. I love it in a deep way. Not, not like I love my wife, it's a different thing. Uh, not like I love Jesus, but I love sweet, pota I love sweet potato pie in, um, in my core. It's a part of me. Um, I grew up in Cincinnati, and I spent a lot of time in the kitchen next to my grandmother. My grandmother was a, um, she was a, a, a real classy kind of a woman, and, and very proud, and, and, um, but everything she touched, she touched in a special way. And in the kitchen, um, she just put a lot of love into everything she did. And even her kitchen was pristine, the count, I, not like, it's hard to keep it like that, right? Grandma's kitchen was tight. Anyone had a, a, a mom, a grandmother, or aunt like that? Grandma's kitchen was tight. And to stand next to her while she's at that table or at the stove, you always got little morsels of something. It's like, wow, ooh, what was that? Well, baby, that's a tomato, and that's an heirloom tomato. It's like, ooh, where'd you get it at the Finley Market? It's like, oh, that was good. But sweet potato pie. So when I think about sweet potato pie, it's not just the cinnamon and the sweet potato and the sugar and the brown sugar and the, not just the, um, the hint of lemon that my grandma might have put in there. It wasn't, it wasn't just that. And it wasn't just the right combination of that. We used to say that, Grandma, you must have put your feet in there. And I don't know if that was like a seasoning or a flavor or if that just meant that she was fully invested, right? She was so invested that she climbed into the pie. Are you feeling how I feel about the sweet potato pie? Not only that, it's not just that I love sweet potato pie, but it taught me something about who I am. Because as a kid in my family in Cincinnati, if you were at grandma's table or in her house with your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, and your uncles and your family, how you ate qualified you to who you were in that family. Did, at least in my mind, this is, this is my memory, that Marvin was a good eater. Marvin was a good boy, because he was a good eater. He, I, I ate the vegetables. I ate, I, I ate all the foods. I loved all the foods. And I think I was a good boy, not just because I was a good eater, but because I ate the things that we ate. And I loved it. And they would say, Marvin, you, you going back for seconds? Yes, ma'am. Because <laughs> I knew I was a good boy. And a good boy got sweet potato pie. I love being a good boy, and I love being a good eater. And I was celebrated. Watch Marvin go back. You're going to get thirds, aren't you? Give Marvin another piece of cake. That's deep inside of me. How do you think I feel about sweet potato pie right now? I don't even know if I can like someone who doesn't like sweet potato pie. No, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> On the other hand, I had a babysitter, and I believe I was about five years old. I have very few memories from my childhood, but I remember as a five-year-old, a babysitter on a, on a, it must have been the summer or Saturday, there was no school, but um, she was determined that I was going to eat oatmeal. 
Notice my face when I say oatmeal. It is nothing like the sweet potato pie face. She wanted me to eat oatmeal. I would not eat them in a box. I would not eat them with a fox. I would not eat them in a tree. I'm not eating oatmeal. I don't care. And she said, you're going to sit there until you eat all of it. And I'm like, I got all day. And I was not a stubborn kid. And I, I was a very complicit kid. But there was nothing, nothing short of prying my mouth open and shoving it in with a spoon. There was no way that my mouth was going to accept one morsel of that slimy, partly soft, partly tender, partly chewy, partly, oh! It's the texture thing. Now, I know there's some oatmeal people in here, and I'm not hating on you. I'm just talking about me. I don't like, you get what I'm saying? How do I feel about sweet potato pie? Oh! How do I feel about oatmeal? Okay, so to this day, I tend, I tend to relate to people as oatmeal or sweet potatoes. I didn't realize I did that. Based, based on an interaction, I see oatmeal or I see sweet potato pie. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so, uh, and this is why this is important. Um, when I first, when my wife and I first moved to Connecticut, um, it was at the height of COVID. It was, um, I, my wife got here six months ahead of me, but I landed here in January 2021. The church, uh, the church was meeting on Zoom. The world was in isolation. I, um, I didn't have a job here. Um, there was all this isolation. And then when, when the church finally started to meet again, um, we were meeting in that weird space that we were all in. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Remember when someone coughed? Half of us had masks, half of us didn't. And then there was a time when we were all required to wear masks, and some people were mad that we were wearing masks. Some people were happy we were wearing masks. It was a weird time. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but some of you in this room were oatmeal to me. I'm sorry. It's not, and it's not even you, but some of you were oatmeal. I'm sorry, but it's true. Because you were in a weird place that day. And you were wearing a mask and I wasn't, or I was wearing a mask and you weren't, and it was weird. And I didn't really know you. And, and I was in a weird place, and I was in a new state. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, a, it was just different. Yeah. And sometimes you're oatmeal to me. And when you're, when you're oatmeal, I think about that babysitter and how she tried to force something on me and how I was uncomfortable, and how we were at an impasse. And she wasn't trying to make a way for, to, to make that oatmeal. She, well, she did. She said, well, let's put some cinnamon on it. And I'm like, well, you sooner put cinnamon on your feet. I'm not eating it. <laughs> right? But there, there were no concessions being made. We were at a stall. We were at a stalemate. Right? We were at an impasse. And... Um, is it safe to say, is it fair for me to say that all of us in this room have some beliefs, behaviors, rituals, attitudes, sensibilities, responses, fears, habits, where the pattern was set in your childhood? Is that fair? I don't know that we have any disagreeers on that. There, there, there are sensibilities and habits and behaviors, fears, anxieties, trepidations that you feel today that are as a result of just something that happened when you were young or, or uh, a culture that was 
you were a part of when you were young, or the dynamics in your household. You feel what I'm saying? Yes. All of us can agree to that. Can we also agree, or can we assume, that some of those beliefs, behaviors, patterns, fears, responses, have served you well? Yes. Right? Who burned their hand on a stove or something? <laughs> Who smashed their finger in a car door or cut themselves with a knife? <laughs> right? I never slammed my finger in the car door. I slammed my sister's finger in the car door twice. <laughs> Grandma had a cellar. Grandma had a cellar door in the, in the kitchen that opened from the floor that went down to the basement. I slammed my sister's finger in that twice. <laughs> on purpose? No, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I don't think it was. I'm going to have to see somebody about that. I don't think it was on purpose. <laughs> Some of those fears, responses, anxieties, some of those things that you learned have served you well. Is it fair also to say that some of those fears, concerns, behaviors, attitudes, responses, and things that you learned as a child, maybe some of them have not served you well? You think that there may be some of those sensibilities haven't served others well, while it may have served you just fine? That's, a, that's an interesting thing to come to terms with. Some of the things that have served me well and have benefited me as a result of the things that I learned, nurture or nature, some things I've learned and have become accustomed to and have become um, acquainted with have served me well, but maybe they haven't served other people as well. In the household where I was praised as a good eater, I, rel I, I reveled in that. I had another family member who was a very picky eater and didn't like certain things didn't like certain vegetables. And we know today that people have some aversions to some kinds of food. I had a family member who was that way. She was mocked. Mm, she, never did, she never did like to eat her food. And it translated, Marvin's a good boy, but you're not. Some of the things that we learned in childhood have served us well, but haven't served others well. And um, how those, those are just small things, right? Take those sensibilities and let's apply them in all these different areas of our life. How do they play out? And then um, if, if you're here today, you have some relationship to or some understanding of, or some curiosity about Jesus, about the life of a disciple, about Christianity, about the Bible, or about spiritual matters. These things must play out in our spiritual lives. They play out whether consciously or unconsciously. Part of the goal of the next three weeks is to make you conscious of how these things play out in your walk, in your spiritual walk. Does that sound like something that would be beneficial for us? Yeah. I'm gonna ask something and I'm, I, I planned three more scenarios to draw you in, but I'm, I, I don't think we need to. Can, can we, t for today, and maybe we take one day at a time, but can we just for today have the mind and the heart to be open to something new and different from what you may already know. And I don't, I don't mean adopt it. I don't mean stand on it. I don't mean put your, all of your faith in it. I mean the idea of there's room in my heart and in my spirit to consider with what I already know, consider something different that could add to me being what God wants me to be. That's, that's the idea, is that um, uh, none of us, I, I don't think, none of us have reached a place in our spiritual walk, in our knowledge, in our intellect, 
where um, there is not room to consider, wow, maybe I need to take another look at that. So we're all on the same page? Yes. Man, you guys look like sweet potato pie. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And listen, if you're a pumpkin pie lover, all right. Uh, you know, it's a close second. I don't hate you. I, I, I'm concerned about you, but <laughs> so it's all right. Um, so part of my purpose today is, to, one, to uh, get you excited about thinking about something in a different way. I hope I've done that much, at least got you curious. Um, the second part of my job today is to introduce um, a neurological way of addressing the kinds of conflict that we incur in our life. A, a neurological way to look at some of the biblical things we're called to be in our daily life. Let's look at it from a brain science kind of way. And uh, so I want to do that introduction. And I haven't taken up too much of my time to get where I am. Um, I think there may, yes. So um, feel free, in case I don't get to all those scriptures, capture it with your phone. There's a camera button if you have an iPhone under notes that will capture the text and type it into your screen. Just an idea, consider that. Um, or you can, you know, uh, if you're over 40, just take a picture. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm over 40. Oh my gosh, my best friend from childhood spent the day with me on Friday and half a Saturday, and it was all of this, going, both of us. <laughs> it's the same kid I climbed trees with and shot BB guns with, and now we're like, hold on, where are my glasses? Oh, they're right here. <laughs> um, just in brief, a scriptural context, uh, Matthew 12, 28 through 31, it basically says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength. I've always considered loving God with all of my mind meant um, investing my mind in the scriptures and learning more about the scriptures and, and, and applying my mind to uh, using the word and studying God and, and uh, studying and studying. Um, but what about using my mind um, in conflict and, and understanding what the brain does. So I'm, can, I want to disclose something to you, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to give you this disclosure with a qualifier. And I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm going to feel some kind of way if this comes back the wrong way, and I may have already mentioned it here before, but I'm a type 1 diabetic. And um, I'm giving you that qualifier because uh, I have, a, I have a general care practitioner that watches over my health. I have an endocrinologist in an office there. I have, I have a, a dietitian that I work with. I have my wife who loves me and kind of watches me. I have a daughter who asks me about how I'm doing. I don't need, I love you, I don't need any of you to ask me if I should be having that piece of cake. Amen, dietitians in the room. I, don't, I love you, but I don't need a monitor of that. And I won't ask you, do you need another pair of shoes or, or, or should you be buying that, right? I'm just saying, I love you, all right. I gotta put it out there because then I, I get attitude when someone goes, mm, thought you were diabetic, you shouldn't be. I'm like, oh my gosh, can a brother have a cookie? Or a sweet potato pie? Um, but I'm saying that because um, I got diagnosed uh, when I turned 40, so it's been um, nearly 20 years that I've been living as a, a diabetic. They diagnosed me, they misdiagnosed me at, at first as a type 2. Uh, knowledge and, and the understanding about it has changed, and it turned out I was really more on a sliding scale. I, I lean more toward a type 1. I won't go into all, what all that means, but what I what I want to share is that I've had to learn and understand how my body works. I need to understand. I can't, I can't get up in the morning, grab something to eat, and go about my day clueless about how my body 
metabolizes sugar and food in general. I gotta know that um, uh, if I eat this banana, bananas spike me really high. A half a banana with a cup of peanuts helps, but the, peanuts, the, the fat in the peanuts process slower, and so I get a spike later on. I gotta know, I gotta know, I gotta know that if I'm gonna do some physical exertion today, I may wanna, I, I could stack up a little bit more carbs right before, but not insulin as much. I gotta know how my body works. I gotta think before I go on a trip, if I'm in the car and it's, it's, it's 100 miles before the next exit, I gotta know that my blood sugar is on point and that I got something to supplement. You feel me? I have to think about that all the time. And it's not, it's not, it's not, a, um, it's not that big a deal, but it is a big deal. You see, um, it's, it's something that, as a part of my daily life, I have, to, I have to know what's going on with my body. Isn't it crazy that we enter into situations where there may be potential conflict, and we have no idea or we have very little idea, or we have a cursory understanding of what's happening with our brain. So let me introduce you to something. Um, uh, Denise found this amazing resource. It was a little heady for me at first when I was reading it, but the second time through, and with some additional time, I'm like, this makes a lot of sense. And now, everywhere I look, it's popping up. Um, so there's a book entitled Escaping Enemy Mode. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not crazy about the language of it, but then when you read it, it's like, okay, well, there's, no, there's nothing else you can call it. Enemy mode, escaping enemy mode is the title of the book. And the authors are Jim Wilder. Um, he's the author of 17 books with a strong focus on applied neuroscience, uh, maturity in leadership and relational skills. So there are two authors, Jim Wilder, and then the second author is Ray Woolridge. He's a retired U.S. Brigadier General with 40 years of military and civilian service in the Department of Defense. Two very impressive guys, and they wrote this book and, uh, looking at how we deal with um, uh, situations where we, are in, uh, we feel we are being opposed. And um, they thought that a great um, fertile ground to do this study and to do this research would be with the Christian church. Why? Why would he put this study about enemy mode in a, uh, as a, a case for Christians? Because we're, we're the ones that laud, I love my enemy. We're commanded. And that's what we, that's where we, um, that's a fundamental principle of, of Christianity is loving our enemies. And you've seen it, and I've seen it in, in recent hours and recent days. Um, people wearing the name Christian and the most god-awful words coming out of their mouth. Hate, vitriol, finger-pointing, name-calling, and I don't care where you sit on any of those matters politically, um, I, can't, I can't see some of that language coming out of Jesus' mouth. I can't see Jesus saying those people. Can't see it. I can't see Jesus' name calling. Now he did call, oh, if there was anything that was a hint of name calling, you know where it was directed? The religious. The people outside of the building, people outside of the fellowship. I mean, the people inside the building, <laughs> inside the, uh, He called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Right? He, the, his harshest words were for people who claimed to be spiritual teachers. So what is enemy mode? Enemy mode is feeling that others are opposed to you. And that may not just be a feeling, 
But when you get the sense that others are in opposition to you, it's easy to find yourself in what this book calls enemy mode. And um, there are three, well, hold on, before I do that, I just want to, I just want to do a litmus test. So just, um, just give me whatever your visceral reaction is, all right? And, and I don't want you to pretend you're not at church right now, but just, just give us something audible maybe as a response to see just wh where you are. <laughs> I, I think I heard something that sounded like a blend of boo and yay. It's like if, if we made an oatmeal sweet potato cake. Oh, wow. Oh, boy, mixed. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so. So it's fair to say, and that's a light note, but we are a divided world. <laughs> and I did not know the divide in, um, in the Northeast and along the coast here because uh, uh, I'm just bald. I, I wear, I just need to cover my dome. It, in the winter, it's cold, and in the summer, I don't want to get a burn. So I just, I throw on any old garbage just to cover my head, and I won't say which one is garbage. Um, <laughs> Enemy mode is feeling others are opposed to you. And here's what, here's the, here are the places that we can go when we find ourselves in enemy mode. And by the way, um, the way, and we'll cover this later, but the way the brain works, you can't effectively um, not ever land in the enemy mode. You can't navigate your life in a way that I'm, I'm never in enemy mode. Because what happens is our brains are so sophisticated that a smell, a glance, a feeling, something, your, our spidey senses, it's your brain um, putting together thousands of puzzle, millions of puzzle pieces all in an instant and saying, mm, this isn't safe. And it happens before you know. And then you don't know until you're in an encounter and then um, if you're aware of it and watching for it, you go, oh, I'm, 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 feeling, I'm feeling like I, I'm on the defensive. And, um, uh, but here's some, of the, here's some of the characteristics. We want the enemy to lose. It's not that I want to win. My winning means you have to lose. You can't discern when others are trying to help. You can't discern. It's the headlights. Hey, um, uh, uh, Tim, you, let, you, you left your headlights on. What? Yeah, I, was, I came in the building. I noticed your headlights are on. Why are you looking at my headlights? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I was coming inside. I was minding my own business. <laughs> I saw your headlights on. I thought you want to know. Oh, so you got to tell me stuff now. No, were, did, were, did you look at everybody's headlights? <laughs> well, no, I, I was coming to Bible study, and <laughs> I tell you what, why don't you let me worry about my headlights, and you worry about your own headlights? You can't tell when others are um, your friends, or you can't, you can't tell. Um, you recruit others to attack your enemy. You feel justified in how you feel, and you all the way up to hate. You feel you feel that it's justifiable. You can see other people. Um, you see other people's motives as bad. Other people's motives aren't quite inbound. There, there's something behind. They have a motive. You turn people into objects, not humans. Um, real quick, I was I was. Um, uh, I was planning an event for last Wednesday where I was going to have a group of people coming into my space and I needed to entertain them and I was putting some things together and I had some running around to do. And um, it was about 12.15 and the people were going to arrive at 1.15. And, 
and I still had a few more stops to do. And the last thing I had to do was to get ice. I wanted to get the ice last so it didn't melt. So I made this stop, that stop, and then my last stop was picking up some little uh, plastic saucers at Dollar General. And I thought, oh, while I'm here, let me see if they have ice. Hey, by the way, do you have ice? And, she's, and the sweet girl behind the counter said, um, uh, we don't have ice, but um, let me see. I was in a hurry. And I had already dropped into enemy mode. I was in a hurry. And sometimes we go into enemy mode because I have to put people in a place where we're non-relational so that I can get my stuff done. If we get relational, I got to look you in the eye and I got to stop and I got to smile and I got to, uh, hey, how was your day? I gotta, and I don't have time for that right now. I have stuff, I have an agenda. And so do you have ice is a yes or no is what I'm thinking. And if it's no, I'm out. But she was trying to help. So she said, um, they used to have ice across the street. And I look across the street, it's boarded up. <laughs> and so I think they have ice at the gas station next door. Um, let me see. Do they? Hey, um, cat. I'm like, I got to go. So I said, so I said thank you. I, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to keep going. So I left. And I got to my car, closed the door. I had been preparing for this thing. And I thought, oh, jeez. Got out of the car. I said, hey, um, I'm in a hurry, and I'm sorry. I was asking if you had ice. And um, I know I can get ice down the street, but uh, they bag it individually, and they had to go in the back, and it was gonna take, it's going to take a few minutes. So um, I'm sorry. I was really abrupt. I'm sorry. And I'm thinking to myself, I was in enemy mode, and she's not my enemy. She was genuinely saying, let me help this man, right? Yeah. And she goes, oh, that's okay. I thought about it, and um, yeah, I, I bought ice yesterday right there. I said, right here? She said, yeah. I said, sweet potato pie, right? I was like, oh. <laughs> so I went and got my ice, and I got back early because I didn't have to go to this other place and wait, and I thought, oh, I got to slow down. Um, you turn people into, I turned her into an object. She was a, a means to my end. She wasn't a woman or a person behind the counter. She was an information source. We can't dehumanize people, right? Um, in enemy mode, you feel alone, um, believing, is, uh, believing that, they're, uh, that no one is on my side. Um, we often attack or, attack or withdraw from our allies when we're in enemy mode. Because um, when we turn off the relational cues, we can't tell when people are on our side or not, so we alienate the wrong people. Um, we see enemy mode as a strength. We, see enemy, we live in enemy mode because I'm a high achiever. And if I slow down and deal with all your personal stuff and get, all, get too friendly or do this or do that, I don't, I'm a higher, I got stuff to do. And if I get relational with you, you slow me down. People, so people are roadblocks. People are, are, are speed bumps. So those are some of the characteristics of uh, enemy mode. And um, I'm, I'm going to hit these really fast because... Um, I want to leave some for uh, future events. Um, but something to note is that all three types of enemy mode impair brain function. They impair brain function so that we can't tell if a person is truly an enemy. Um, we turn off those relational uh, receptors, those relational connections that tell us that, oh, this person is a person, this person um, is uh, a friend. This person is substantial. I don't, they're human. We turn, those receptors turn off and then we don't relate to them well. But there are three different types of enemy mode. The first one is simple, and I didn't name these. Simple enemy mode. It's, uh, that's, uh, that's the mode I was in when I had something I had to get done. And I, uh, it's, it's a passive, it's, um, Tear, it's breaking down the things that would make me relational. I'm not going to make eye contact with you. I'm not going to engage in long conversation. I want short answers. I got to keep it moving. Don't get in my way. That's kind of a simple enemy mode. You ever see that played out at home? 
you, you, you've been on both sides of that scenario? Yeah, um, uh, the purpose of going through this material is for us as uh, followers of Christ to see before we look at the world, how, why is the world so divided? Let's come home and let's look at ourselves, let's look at our households, let's look at our interactions uh, uh, with the people that we're around, and let's, let's look at ourselves, right? And um, simple enemy mode, it starts with feeling someone is not on our side. It's an uneasy tension that develops when relational connection signals are missed ignored, mistrusted, or feared. And you know, um, I think about when there's fear, it, it's not always something that you did, to, it's not that you did it intentionally, but you live in enemy mode as a way to protect yourself from the things you fear, from some of those things that you learned. And um, getting out of enemy mode and into relational mode creates an opportunity for you to um, learn what's behind that fear and ease some of those things. Stupid enemy mode. I did not name these. <laughs> stupid enemy mode. And I, we should qualify this. As we learn more about stupid enemy mode and these other modes, I'm telling you in advance, I know, not because I've tried it, I just know, if you're in that situation at home or at work and you say, you're just in stupid enemy mode, that's not going to go well. So don't, don't do that, don't do that. Stupid energy mode, uh, in, enemy mode, it's, it's a high energy moment fueled by intense anger. It's a high energy moment fueled by intense anger. And it's in those moments that you, um, the, the part of your brain that uh, is logical, reasoning, and um, uh, applies uh, understanding of relationships and is logical, that part of your brain is shut off the connections are turned off. Maybe because you've been in simple enemy mode for a long time and you, now I'm exploding, but whatever the case is, you've turned, those receptors are turned off so there's no logic going on. And so it's rage, it's that hot anger, and in those times you say things that you later regret saying, and you do things that you wish you hadn't done. And when someone says, what were you thinking? Well, you weren't thinking, and that's why it's called and be careful when you say that. Uh, intelligent enemy mode, and again, I did not name these, but it, uh, it, is, it, is, it makes sense when you hear it in the book. Intelligent enemy mode, um, this, type, uh, this type of enemy mode does not miss the signals that simple enemy mode, they, they recognize your human behavior, they recognize those human qualities, they're sensitive to how you look and how you feel, and they're aware of your physical disposition and your mental, they're aware. And they're not uh, hot anger, like stupid enemy mode. They, don't, um, they are more likely cold and calculating. Um, in uh, intelligent enemy mode, um, anger fills the brain with plans of, uh, filled with resentment, sabotage, revenge. It plots, it deceives, it misdirects, uh, it's more diabolical. We want to stay out of intelligent enemy mode. Um, so can we see how these, uh, this information can be valuable? Uh, see how uh, it can apply to our daily relationships? Um, uh, I, I'm really hoping that just with that information, we'll be more inclined to, um, uh, to roll up our sleeves and do, uh, do some of the hard, hard work, do some of the heavy lifting and spend some time. Um, and um, as it relates to cultural connections, um, the uh, unity is the idea. And um, um, we, what's interesting about this body of believers is that we are a diverse group. And we celebrate our diversity that, that we come in different sizes, shades, cultures, and, and heritage. Um, but while on the outside we, um, uh, we can come and worship together, 
Um, I think there's some things that have happened in the past and we anticipate uh, uh, in the coming months that uh, it could get more challenging because we, um, we don't all share the same ideals and ide ideologies about a lot of things. And so we have to create pathways where it's safe to talk, where we can talk in a relational way and not in an adversarial way, right? We can talk not opposed to one another, but standing on the same side of the fence with the same goals. And that means that um, uh, as believers, we gotta have the same goals. The most important thing is identifying who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, right? That didn't even sound right coming out of my mouth. Jesus calls us to love one another above ourselves. Um, the, the example of the Good Samaritan was um, uh, someone who was an outsider, took care of the person who was in distress. Jesus loved the outsider, the alien, the foreigner, the widow, the marginalized, the depressed, the discouraged, the one that didn't look like everyone else the one whose behaviors or attitudes are misunderstood. Jesus cared about that person, the, the, the one who had leprosy and no one would see or touch, the woman who was bleeding that no one, everyone uh, unclean, unclean, unclean. Jesus was drawn to those people, those individuals. And if, um, if, if we want um, a different world and we want to be, um, what God has called us to be, we've got to, um, we've got to share the values that are, uh, that are in line with the scriptures and then all, all the other things, let's have room to talk about those. Amen, Amen. so um, I, um, have I done my job? Oh, yeah. All right, uh, I'm gonna end there. Thank you and um, There's a uh, there's an announcement for them. You didn't bring me no pie. I know. There's nothing up here. <laughs> no sweet potato pie up here for me. <laughs> oh, my brother. Thank you, Marvin. That was really wonderful. I really appreciate you. Uh, opening up our eyes and our hearts to a really uh, different way of approaching subjects that we can relate to instead of immediately take one or another sides on. It's really well done. Uh, thank you, brother. I'm here to pray for our uh, contribution, and uh, a little later on we'll do our hope contribution as well, and in between we'll do some announcements. I uh, just want to let you know that there we will do a contribution for uh, the church, and then and for those of you that are online or watching, thank you already for your donation. And then uh, for those who uh, are here, feel free. Uh, but then the hope contribution is for something that we do also. So it's, it's, it's uh, traditional for us to actually do that too at this time. So let's go to God in prayer for our contribution. Heavenly Father, it's a, it's a blessing. <laughs> it's a very large blessing to live in this country where we are abundant and we're able to uh, experience many things that uh, many folks do not have the opportunity for. Uh, but, you know, it's your... Everything is yours, God. It's not ours. You know this. You gave this to us, and you expect us to be good stewards. And, uh, and, and instead of, uh, and, and that card is part of these, being a cheerful giver, God, as Jesus taught us to give, uh, pointed to the people that were giving not of the amount but of the heart, and, uh, and help us, Father, in a place where we live in abundance to give uh, freely, because we've been given to freely, God, and uh, to see that there are met. the only way that we really can, you know, help us in our small way is to give back as freely as we were taught and, and, and saw given to us, Father. So I pray that the offering today is, is fragrant to you, not just complicit. Uh, we love you. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So while the uh, baskets are going around, uh, I wanted to make a few announcements. Uh, I'm laughing because I remember what I, Marvin just said about this thing. <laughs> uh, I love it. I don't really, but. Oh. <laughs> 
So uh, we do have midweek uh, coming up. It's congregational this Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. here. Uh, next Sunday is potluck. Talk to any of your family group leaders, please. Said next Sunday. Uh, yeah, a week from today. Thank you. <laughs> Just making sure I got that right. <laughs> No idea, man. Mike will get so many calls, and then he'll call me, and we'll all be eating McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> potluck next Sunday, a week from today, here. Talk to your family group leaders about what you can bring. You want to bring enough for your family group, right? And you want to bring not all sweet potato pie. Sorry, Marvin. Uh, but if you're in Far Marvin's family group, don't bring oatmeal. All right. Main sides and dish. Uh, main sides, dish, and dessert. Uh, talk again to your family group leader about it. There's Catalyst meeting here today, 20 minutes after service at, let's see, should be about 11.35. So just keep an eye on everything, depends on how quick it takes to wrap up, but 20 minutes after the last song. And one last thing I want to talk about here is a congressional, uh, uh, for the congregation, we'd like to uh, pray for uh, uh, the Vanessa's uh, son, Thomas. He's uh, going through some tests. He's got some health things going on. I uh, just want to make sure that we'll keep it at that, but uh, be praying for them, be thinking about them, and uh, give them a little hug, and ask them how they're doing. All right, that's about it. We're going to uh, pray now for the hope contribution, and uh, again, it's a free will giving, so uh, let's go back to God in prayer uh, before the singers come up. Heavenly Father, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to give to uh, not only our own community, but communities that we uh, that are around us, or even communities we will never even see, unless, of course, we decide to be there and help where those funds actually get put in play. And then it's an amazing thing to watch, God, your, your, your plan across a, a world to come to one place that perhaps I donated to, or perhaps I gave to several weeks ago or months ago, and the next thing you know, we're wearing a t-shirt and you're helping. And you think, my gosh, this is where the, how the resources get here. And then you remember, oh, it's because God taught me to give. And I pray, Father, I'm glad that people give their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength, their time, not just their money, to really help. I think about people who have gone out on missions or have gone to help rebuild things when the calling went out. And, uh, and that's an amazing calling. And I want to be able to be a part of that, Father. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of that. And I pray for our, our, our contribution in this continues to serve that in ways that we can't even imagine. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, it turns out I didn't do all of my job. Um, so um, this coming Wednesday is uh, the next step in this series. And we're, everyone is invited, uh, members and not... If you're not a member, you're invited. Uh, there's not a fee or anything like that, but we're going to do some um, fun activities, and we've made them fun because some of the material down the road could get a little weighty, but right now it's, it's going to be some fun activities for us to um, understand what could be complicated information. We're going to put it into practice in a way that you'll be able to recognize where you are and make Adapt, uh, adaptation so that you can get where you want to be. So that's Wednesday here at 7.30. Also, lastly, um, on the church's website, GNL, seven, what did I say? Seven. Oh, seven. That's when I time I show up. No. <laughs> CP time. No, no, no. Um, uh, seven o'clock. But um, on the website, uh, the GNL website, if you need help, someone will help you. But um, if you're on your phone, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage, and there's a ministry section. Cultural Connections has a link with all these resources, the book, videos, a lot of great information on, um, on this program that we're doing. You can listen to some of it or get some of the information before Wednesday. Thanks. Hello. I've got two invitations for you guys. Well, one for guys and girls. That's the first one. This Saturday uh, at 9 o'clock, we're going back to Waterford Country School. We didn't make it last year because of the weather. Hopefully, pray that we have good weather this year, and we have plenty of time for a reschedule if, if not. But we, we're going to go out to the uh, farm and their campground areas, and we're going to do our usual cleaning up, 
Ben, uh, ben Turner has uh, texted me, said he's got some fun projects for us. So, you know, the guys, it's all that, you know, working with tools, right, Don? And um, they, they love going out there. We all love going out there. We can paint, we clean, we do all sorts of stuff. It's from 9 to 12. We want you to register at the back table so we know how many people are coming and can plan the different jobs, and also on Volunteer Hub, which we'll tell you more about if you don't know about that already. And the second invitation is for the ladies. It's for five Saturdays from now, May 18th. We're having a day for women. And it's called, well, it's called International Women's Day. A lot of us collaborated on ideas for classes and spe a special speaker, yummy food. And it's going to be interesting and inspiring. So. Uh, please sign up as soon as you can. It's only ten dollars, and that includes uh, different international luncheon foods. It's going to be—we're going to have decorations. You're going to feel like it's a great experience. I—I I wouldn't want to miss it. So invite your friends, men too. Invite your friends so they can become our friends. So we all can look forward to that. So what if country school this Saturday? Anybody? Anybody? Even if you're here for the first time. Welcome to come. Same thing with uh, May 18th for all of the ladies. Anyone that wants to come, love to have you. Thank you. Oh, Mike. There we go. Amen. Let's stand up. We got a closing song. Amen. I hope you're encouraged today. I hope you're encouraged to come back and hear more as we go through this series. Let's praise God together as we close out today. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Amen, church. <laughs>